Thank you. Well, it's so nice of you to have me here to give this talk. I really appreciate it, and it's great to see such a crowd. I hope you'll interrupt as you please as we go through this and ask lots of questions, because that's the way I prefer to present. So, um, And I, I don't see a clock, so I will consult my watch, which is an hour fast, but it has, it's an hour and a half, right, that we have, so I should be able to deal with that. Okay. Um, so this, this paper is called um, State of the Art in Value Added Models of Teacher Performance, um, Taking Stock of What We Know and Don't Know. Uh, it, it represents um, a composite of work that I have done with um, Mark Recase and Jeffrey Woldridge. Uh, Mark Re Recase is, a, is an expert on assessment, very um, you know, uh, well-known, and Jeffrey Woldridge is a very well-known uh, econometrician. Um, whom I think was here like two years ago or the year before, uh, probably talking about stuff from our same, the same project. Um, and then we have a host of, of students uh, working on this project with us, although Stephen Dieterle is now a professor in Scotland, uh, Edinburgh. This, this work was supported by IES, the U.S. Department of Ed, and uh, also the, many of the students were supported by a pre-doctoral training grant from IES. So um, what are value-added models? You know, I'm going to call them VAMs, probably. And I apologize that I'll probably be standing. Maybe I can stand over here. Get in front of, pull over there. There we go. Um, so there are statistical models that are intended to capture this contribution, this value added of an input to student achievement. Okay? So in the context of education, that's what, that's what they are. And they're always going to be characterized by using some standardized test scores and a control of some sort for prior achievement. So, uh, you know, they can be used for evaluating a number of things, not just teachers, but teaching practices, uh, schools, uh, educational programs, et cetera. And the focus of this is just going to be on, on value-added models for teacher performance. So the basic idea is just to compute the average amount of learning growth for students in a teacher's class that is due to the teacher. Uh, so intuitively it makes sense, this notion of value added. You certainly wouldn't want to judge a teacher by just the average test scores of the students in that teacher's class, right? Because some teachers could have high scoring students and other teachers could have low scoring students, but they could both be equally effective teachers. So the idea of trying to get at the achievement gains of the particular teacher students um, is much more intuitive and ap intuitively appealing. So they are increasing in popularity. This is probably stuff you all know. <laughs> I'll just try to run through these introductory slides fairly quickly. But it's in, in line with this philosophy of the accountability movement. So we want some performance measures. We want to measure people on outcomes. Um, the Race to the Top competition promoted the use of student test scores as a component of teacher evaluation. Um, so according to this report that came out in 2012, at least 43 states were requiring annual teacher evaluations, 32 of which were incorporating student performance. It's probably higher now. The applications have, of value-added models have sparked controversy. First of all, in the Chicago teacher strike, it was a big point of controversy. Um, the public releases have, you know, angered teachers and unions. The, the LA Times, so back in 2010, the LA Times first published uh, measures for LAUSD teachers, uh, Los Angeles Unified School District teachers on the web. So you can go and look up a particular teacher and look at that person's value added score. Um, New York City w went through a bunch of court value battles, but the Wall Street Journal pu published measures. You can go, you know, these are the websites in case you want to just go on there and look up a teacher. <laughs> They're very easy to do. Um, so here's like a Wall Street Journal one for this person. Um, so, you know, Robert Smithberg, and they just show that, in, that Robert Smithberg was average in math sixth grade uh, and below average in English. That's basically the information they give you. Here's one from LA. It um, shows M Janet Smith. I just took screenshots of stuff that I pulled up on the web. Um, here's from Janet Smith. It just shows that here she is in math effectiveness down here under really probably in the least effective category according to these measures. So it has had a lot of 
it has had an impact on morale. I mean, there were some there were some reports of a particular teacher who committed suicide because he was very demoralized about his value-added score on the on the web, among other things. Um, sort of sent him over the edge, and people have been upset about these public, you know, public labeling. Um, I'm not sure how you would feel if you were, you know, somebody could look up on the web and see a rating of effective or you know, ineffective or whatever. Um, so why use value added? Why do this? Well, the advocates claim that, first of all, well, they're based on things we care about. We care about, we have a measure of student learning. We care about that as an outcome. So let's get something that directly measures that. That they're data driven and therefore they're objective. Um, big point is they better, maybe better than the old system evaluating teachers, which was just teachers were rewarded based on experience and education alone. Um, some people say, well, they can supplement or maybe be better than other alternative measures of teacher performance. We can definitely have a good discussion about that. Um, classroom observations, for example, uh, can be very unreliable. Uh, and they may also have, they may struggle to pick up cognitive skills. They may be better at picking up non-cognitive cognitive skills in the classroom than cognitive skills. Um, they may be more uh, economical than other measures. Uh, Certainly, the classroom observations are very time consuming and costly. And since NCLB has made test scores ubiquitous, then they're kind of readily at hand, except for some of the data issues that we will discuss. Okay, why don't, why shouldn't we use them? Well, the opponents would say, well, they may be biased, so that's a biggie. Um, they may contain a considerable amount of error, and they may be based on tests that are themselves questionable in some way. And they may be bad for teacher morale. So what I'm going to do in this talk is just outline the methodological concerns related to value-added models for teacher evaluation. I'm just going to prov provide a very sort of overview of some of the current approaches to VAMS. I did send a paper, if anybody wants to look at it, it's very preliminary. And I have not yet dropped in like tables and things into it. But if you, you know, are interested in seeing that, um, Mimi and Jason have it. And I don't it might have been distributed already. Um, and I'd love feedback on it. So. Uh, so we'll provide an overview and then highlight maybe what is still missing in our understanding of VAMS. OK, primary concerns. Let's start with that. Assessment quality, data quality, and bias due to non-random assignment. That's how I'm going to categorize them. Assessment quality. First of all, do the assessments test what we want students to learn? So there's an issue of, do, first of all, breadth of knowledge. Because the tests are based on a limited number of items, there are all these constraints on how much time we can spend testing kids and how many items we can subject them to. Well, there's a limit. Um, the type of knowledge, do they sort of capture more things that have to do with rote memorization, or do they, act, do they actually get at critical thinking? Um, do they capture non-cognitive skills, such as behaviors for success? Another question is, do they align with the curriculum taught? So basically, we kind of know that in order to do well on value added, a teacher has to teach to the test, more or less. Um, or at least, you know, if they're not doing it intentionally, they have to somehow, their teaching must be matching up with what's on the test. So, that's not such a bad thing, right, if the test tests what we want students to learn. I mean, that wouldn't be so bad. Um, but so the question is, does the curriculum support doing this? Um, then there's the last question, is there considerable measurement error in the tests? And I am going to circle back to that issue at the end of this talk. Data quality. So there's this issue of linkages between students and teachers. And Dale and I were talking about that just a couple hours ago. Um, so many state systems don't have great linkages between students. It's hard to know which students a teacher had. Um, and also, students might move in the middle of the year. So maybe your linkage is good for part of the time, but really actually not for part of the time. Um, inaccurate matching can definitely cause error. So. Uh, another issue is the sample sizes. So as we know in statistics, the, the more, the larger the sample size, the better, you know, more precise your, your estimates can be. So we have issues of maybe small classes of maybe, you know, 12 students, 20 students even isn't that big. 
Um, so we have a problem, you know, if there are not that many students per teacher contributing to this teacher's value-added score. Um, the, uh, so the, the measures can be very noisy if there's just a small number of students forming the basis for the effectiveness score. Um, another thing is that, you know, we, can, we could combine several years of data. So like say like there's a fourth grade teacher and then we can just look at a bunch of different cohorts of kids that go through to that teacher and estimate that teacher's value added over sort of as the average of over all of those cohorts. So we can get bigger sample sizes that way. But, you know, not all teachers are going to have a long track record. I mean, some may be in the data for much longer than others. And of course, you're also, when you do that, you're averaging, right, over. So you're not, a, you're sort of not allowing the teacher to be good one year and less good another year or whatever. You're not, you're sort of not allowing for those variations to take place. Okay, another um, issue is, is non-random assignment. So when you think about it, why would a teacher students show high growth? Well, it could be because it's a very good teacher. And that's what we're hoping, right, when we, when we estimate these measures, that that's the reason why we're showing a good value-added score. Um, it could be that the teacher teaches more effectively to the test. So, again, that wouldn't be so terrible if the test actually captured, a, you know, a very large amount of what we want the students to, to learn. Um, it could be because the teacher has better resources. Or the teacher has students with more involved parents. Or the teacher has a class of faster learners. Or the teacher has a class of students who are just more likely to show growth on tests, for example. Let's just say there's some kind of a ceiling effect on the test. So teachers have a lot of high people coming in with high performance scores from last year. Can they grow that much? Um, maybe not. Um, so these last four reasons would be much less of an issue, you know, if students were randomly assigned to teachers, because then you'd have a few, you know, a few students in these categories of more involved parents, et cetera, or it would kind of even out, you know, uh, over the, 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 you know, across the teachers. Um, but if, obviously, if people are uh, students with these characteristics of having more involved parents or you know, being faster learners, except, et cetera, are more concentrated in, in certain teachers' classes and not in others, and so it's a non-random distribution of these characteristics, then we've got problems. So we, and of course we, you know, we know, or at least we know anecdotally, that principals assign teachers, students to teachers in purposeful ways. They'll often group students together on the basis of, of ability, and they may also match classrooms to teachers on the basis of teacher skills. That may not be a bad thing, right? They may be wanting to do the best thing for these particular students, matching them, matching them up with the right teachers. But it does put a wrench in the work for works for you know getting these value-added um, measures. Okay, let's just go through the theoretical model underlying VAMS. And since I'm at Vanderbilt, I don't have to to worry about having <laughs> equations up on the board. Uh, <laughs> But anyway, so there's this general model of cumulative effects on learning. Um, the notion is that past and present experiences will contribute to present learning. So the basic idea here is that, um, let's see, this is achievement of child i at time t is just some loose whatever function, unspecified function of educational inputs that you know are from the present to all the way back in the past, all the relevant past and present inputs family characteristics, all the relevant from now, from way back to birth or pre-birth. And, you know, some, what we're going to call here is this time constant fixed student effect. So some sort of student characteristic that endures is constant over time, like, you know, you could say ability or you could say motivation or some kind of a personality feature that makes that child either do well or poorly. Or you could even consider it like a disability that's constant over time. Um, and then you've got this other sort of catch-all for representing time-varying unobserved factors. So when you want to estimate this in a regression model, you're going to make a bunch of assumptions. So generally, you assume that it's a linear model. 
So we assume that the functional form does not vary over time. We assume that the effect of all the past inputs decays at a constant rate over time. This is pretty big. It's called the geometric distributed lag assumption. Um, we assume that the time constant unobserved uh, individual factors uh, have the same impact in every time period. It's another big, big deal. Um, we assume that there are no interactions between teachers, students, etc. And then once you do that, you get this. <laughs> so you can get this very simple um, thing that you can actually estimate without past inputs. So it's basically here, it's just uh, current achievement of child I at time t. So this will be the achievement of the student at the end of the year that they've had the teacher. Okay? And then it will be regressed on prior achievement, or you could have more prior achievement scores. Uh, and then you can have some current that, you know, from that year, educational inputs, and in our case, what we're interested in is just teachers, like what teacher they had. That's the main, the main piece of E that we're interested in. And then these family characteristics, um, which are usually things like, uh, you know, demographics, free and reduced lunch eligibility, um, and then we've got, uh, you know, we still have this term lurking around here, that time invariant student effect. And then we've got this, this error term here that's the unobserved factors. So with all those assumptions, we were able to like shrink that thing down to this and we can estimate it. So there are all sorts of methodological choices next to consider. Okay, so you can consider, I'm just gonna list a couple of them here. Gain score versus lag score random versus fixed teacher's effects, pa using panel data versus cross-sectional data, um, using teacher indicated variables like yes or no they had the teacher versus like a fraction. I had this teacher for two-thirds of the year, this teacher for one-third of the year. Um, the inclusion of student demographics, um, you can choose instrumental variables models, um, you can shrink your estimates, use empirical Bayes which is a particular type of shrinkage estimate. There's Bayesian models, growth percentile models, et cetera. So there's all this host of choices. So whenever somebody says, oh, we ran a value-added model, there actually are a lot of questions you need to ask about, well, what was your value-added model really like? You know, what characteristics did it have? So let's just start with this lag score approach. This is kind of like the simple one. Um, you basically could just regress these current, whoops, sorry about that. Regress these current um, test score on past test scores, uh, and then just put in a bunch of dummy variables for the teachers, put in some student demographics, and then just run that regression. And then what's going to happen is the coefficients on each one of these teacher dummy variables is going to they will be your value added mes uh, measure for the teacher. Any questions on that? Okay. So when are we going to worry about bias? Well, as we know from statistics, we always worry about bias when there's something lurking around in here that's correlated with the thing that we're interested in. So we want to, we want to worry about bias due to, like, say, non-random assignments of students to teachers or whatever if we are not able to control for the assignment mechanism. Now, the nice thing about this particular specification is that if students are grouped together based on uh, their prior test score, this particular formulation actually does control for it because we've got the assignment mechanism here on the right hand side. And the way regression works is that you're partialing out the effect of, you know, each of these variables from the effect of the others. So, um, so we're not, it's not so worrisome uh, to have non random assignment of students to teachers in this particular formulation of it with the lag score. A lot of popular methods do not control for the assignment mechanism. So, for example, this sort of the so-called gain score regression, where you just have these, you take the score of the kid at the end of the year, the teacher had the kid, and subtract off the score from the prior year, and you just make this different score, and you use that as your dependent variable. But on the right-hand side, you don't have any lag test scores that you're partialing out from the, from the estimates of these betas. Okay, and then there's the residual based methods where you have, you regress the 
current test scores, generally on a prior score, it doesn't have to be, but generally it is, and you have uh, a bunch of student demographics, potentially, um, and then, but you don't have any teacher dummies or anything in there. So what you're going to do is you're going to just take all these residuals that you estimate. Is that my phone? Mm, sorry. If it is, I apologize. Um, so there's, uh, you could be uh, estimating all these residuals, and then you just average those residuals, and that becomes your measure of teacher performance. But when you do that, and this is very popular, um, especially with adding shrinkage to it. So the Met, Report, Met Project, I don't know the Measures of Effective Teaching Project, funded by the Gates Foundation, they use that method. Um, paper that's gotten a lot of publicity, Chetty et al. uses that method. Um, empirical based models Im implicitly do this. Um, and the growth models also don't have any kind of control. Um, so the essence here, the difference here is that the difference here is that you've got a prior achievement on the right-hand side, but no teacher dummies. So there's no parceling out going on. Whereas in the other one, the lag score method that I mentioned before, this one, you've got them both there, prior achievement and the teacher dummies. So you are parceling out the potentially what could be an assignment mechanism for assigning students to teachers. So in simulations that we've done, uh, we show that the gain score and the residual ba based methods don't look as good um, uh, compared with the lag score specification when non-random assignment e exists. So in simulations, you can, you can generate the data you can, and you know what the true teacher effect is because you generated it. And then, you can come, and then you can act like you don't know what it is, estimate it, and you can compare the true one with the estimates. Yeah, Dale. So it would be like um, uh, teachers, uh, principals group students on the basis of past test scores, and then. That's my question. Is it anything but the past test scores? Yes. In this paper, we look at non-random assignment based on past test scores, initial test scores, so like an, an initial when they first got into the school system, but, and also student heterogeneity, so the, the C, the C term. Also, we look at that one as well. The student fixed effect, yes. So, so yeah. You're comparing a model that has a student fixed effect and a lag test score to models that lack one or both. And you're saying that when you assign teachers based on those, the models that have them work better. So, this doesn't seem like much of a surprise. No. It's not, but, but look at all the people that are about, doing it. If you're wrong about how they're assigning kids, then those models aren't going to necessarily work better, right? Right, but, but let's think about what other ways they could be assigning kids. They spread the troublemakers around. Right, so we don't have a behavioral variable, right? You might think that it may be correlated with the student fixed effect, or it could be correlated with past test scores. But it's true we do not have a different variable that's completely uncorrelated with any of the things in our, you know, these other things that we're put, we're not putting something like that in the data generating process. But, yeah, but I mean, do you think that, I mean, I think my sense is that that, that variable is going to be correlated in some way with these variables that we're talking about. So we're trying to go for, in the simulation, the things that we think are the main candidates for um, s sorting and matching. Yeah, you could make it, you could make it better, but if you, you know, you, if, what you'd have to assume for, for these results to be irrelevant is that a lot of that goes on and it's not correlated with past test scores or the student fixed effect. So, you know, I, I don't know that. It would be interesting to investigate if you have data on absent, you know, um, um, behavioral, like suspensions and things like that to see how correlated it is with these other variables. But, yeah. Ron? Do you know, like, Tennessee used to be proud of the Do you know what model they use of these tools? 
choices? Um, <laughs> okay, Dale, you have to help me with this one. <laughs> so the EVAS model, um, uh, I'm going to say that it uses a lot of prior test scores, but it doesn't control for demographics. So Dale, you know more about this, their particular, so this is shrouded in mystery. Um, you know, it's the original Sanders model, and SAS Institute has a sort of a pro proprietary, um, you know, uh, hold on the code and the, the methods and everything. And um, but I think some people, including Dale, have sort of sorted it out and sort of presented it. And I would say that it's probably more akin to um, uh, probably more akin to the um, empirical Bayes model um, than others. What would you say, Dale? I don't think it, I, I don't think you can compare it to the one with the teacher dummies. Well, the, the closest thing to mm -hmm. it that you have up here would be if you took your main score model and took out everything on the right hand side of the, uh, the teacher. That would be the, the nearest thing. But they, the, the, their model is. Okay. So like a, just a straight gain score model and no student demographics, yeah. So I would, yeah. Now I would classify that as a weak model um, in terms of like taking care of some of these bias issues. Yeah. It seems like there's a core group of people who are excluding yourself. Mm -hmm. Has it, people gravitated to one of these primarily or has it been all over the map? Well, I would say that what's going on right now is that there's kind of a, it's almost like a, um, I don't want to use the word war, but there's an intense competition, that's the word I'm looking for, uh, right now. So there are vendors uh, out there who are promoting their particular methods, so there's SAS Institute is one of them. And a lot of times the people in the, in the position of having to compute these measures in the states or large districts are just saying, you know, we're going to give you our data, give us the measures. So there's the SAS Institute, there's the um, variant, Value Added Research Center at Wisconsin. I think they do them for New York. Um, there's uh, AIR does some. Uh, the Center for Assessment uses the Colorado Growth Model. Um, so it's kind of like what happens is people in positions of having to make the decisions are generally for some, you know, I don't know exactly what their decision making process is, but they're probably entertaining the thought of just contracting out with some of these organizations. Sometimes they will compute them themselves in districts or states. Um, now with the PARC and the Smarter Balance, Balance Assessment, the new consortia that are going to be creating the assessments uh, that are going to go with the Common Core, the war, the competition <laughs> has intensified because what's going to happen is that there, you know, so many more states and districts will be using these, one of these two sets of assessments, and they'll probably have some kind of an add-on for just punching out teacher value-added measures, you know, with these, um, you know, when they sell the package for the assessment. So it is important, I think, at this juncture for us to stand back and take stock of what we know about these measures and what we don't know. And I myself am not, um, I don't think they're all good and I don't think they're all bad. So I'm in favor of using them, but with a recognition of their limitations. And I'm in favor of making decisions as to what methods to use with research trying to show you which ones are the best methods. Okay, so, so as to the question of whether non-random assignment exists, well, in this paper that is a working paper, actually it's a revise and resubmit right now um, at JPAM, but uh, we use administrative data from grades three to six from a very large southern state, which I can't name, um, and the findings are that the assignment, um, assignment based on prior test scores occurs in a fairly large number of schools, particularly in sixth grade. So it looks like in our group, it, um, it looks like something like close to 70% of the sixth grade uh, schools are using the, um, are assigning students to classrooms based on prior test scores. Distributed evenly among the teachers? So everybody 
gets five kids who did well and five kids who did medium and five kids who did poorly? Or do you mean they're tracked on something? They're tracked, okay. yes. So the way we did this is with multinomial logits for every grade year, school grade year cell. Um, but I can talk about that in more detail if anybody's interested. Um, we also uh, looked at, well, if we break up our sample into the schools that did this kind of tracking and the schools that didn't, and then we looked at the correlation across different value-added estimators. So we, so we computed the teacher value-added scores with different methods. And then we break up our sample into two groups, the schools with the tracking and the schools without the tracking. And then we look at how well the value-added me methods correlate with each other on the teacher evaluation, the, the, the teacher measures. And we'll, we'll find that the correlations do decrease in the presence of the non-random assignment. So there is something going on this when, when there is this non-random assignment or non-random grouping in this case, which is not even necessarily fully non-random assignment. But in this case, we will find that you're going to see a big difference in the correlation between a lag score model and a gain score model in terms of how they, you know, evaluate the teacher, okay? Less of a difference between like an empirical base and a lag score. So we've just been working out what's going on there, why the bias is less, why there's less of a difference there than the gain score model, but it has to do with the direction of the um, potential non-random assignment and the prevalence of positive matching, which is good teachers to good students. And the way that works with the sign of the bias and the error term. Just strike that from the record if it sounded too complicated. But <laughs> or I'm happy to go, go into it in more detail. But um, Okay, so, so that's some stuff that we, we know. I, I want to just start talking about what's still missing in our, our understanding. So there are a lot of issues we're still trying to understand. So parental responses, measurement error, size of teacher effects. Influence of peer effects, the interaction, the idea of different decay rates. Um, we do know, know from some prior research that summer learning loss, for example, is different for different subpopulations of student. Um, so I hear I'm just going to talk about two issues because for lack of time. Uh, there's the impact of the value-added um, models of parental, the impact on these measures of parental responses to teacher assignments and then the impact of these models um, of measurement error in test scores. Let's see how I'm doing for time. I seem to be breezing through this. Okay, so do parents respond to teachers' assignments in ways that compromise value-added models? So in economic ter terms, we're always worried about something called contemporaneous endogeneity, which it means that there's something going on in this time period in the error term that's causing, uh, you know, that's unobserved uh, and is correlated with the, like, the teacher assignment. So let's just say I'm a parent, my, te my kid gets a certain teacher, I know that teacher's a poor teacher, I'm going to go out and hire a tutor. So that's a really serious threat to these kind of models. And it, in prior, prior achievement, you know, that assignment mechanism doesn't doesn't help us out in this kind of situation. So we have this endogenous situation. So the tutor could be um, teaching the kids things that are going to help the kid look good on the end of course exam, but it's going to be ascribed to the teacher. Okay? So that's a problem. Now, we might believe it's not a severe problem if we think that, for example, parents with greater means may supplement education regardless of what kind of teacher the kid gets. So there might just be wealthier parents who just get tutors automatically, whether they think that the student has a poor teacher or a good teacher. Or let's just say the kid does, doesn't do well on the first test and the parent, you know, the wealthier parents run out and get the tutors. But that has nothing to do with how good the teacher is. So if we think that, you know, parental wealth, then maybe some of our demographics, like you know, free and reduced lunch eligibility, in some crude way will control for this and we don't have to worry about it as much. We've taken it out of the unobserved, massive stuff in that error term. 
The other thing is parents' appraisals of teachers may not be accurate. So, you know, they may think they're a good teacher or a poor teacher and it, they may not really know. Um, I don't know what all you parents think, but those of you who are parents here. Um, so ironically, so this is kind of interesting. So the more parents get access to teacher value added measures, the more of this kind of responsiveness may occur. So in a way, the better we get at doing value added, the worse we're going to have a problem of endogeneity because people might actually be looking at them and responding and then compensating and then it's like a mess. So that is kind of an interesting thing to think about. Yeah. So uh, if, if there's compensating behavior by parents is an issue, um, you'd expect to see it has a bigger effect when parents have the capacity to compensate, right? Right. Which you've been saying. Mm -hmm. So has anybody actually looked at evidence that value added is not as informative when you look at uh, teachers who been teaching kids whose parents have that capacity versus other hmm. either either in the sense that everybody looks average when you look at the teachers of the uh, high SES kids. Yeah. Or if you take the teacher out of that environment, put them in another one that they're not but well, that's not the case, the old score is not nearly as informative as it would be if you took a teacher out of an environment where parents can't do that. Right. And move them someplace. Yeah. Has, has anybody done any work on that? Not so specifically focused that I can think of, but it sounds like a really good idea. Um, yeah, I think it's a good idea. We are in the section of things we still need to learn, so this is like, you know, good ideas for future research here. Um, yeah, so this is just basically some just thinking that we, you know, coming up with these notions at the moment, but there's a lot of more work that needs to be done on these issues. Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. That the secondary level where students actually choose which teachers to take hmm. to a certain degree, is there any evidence or does anyone examine whether or not students are responsive to the value added by the teachers and therefore hmm. they, they have some choice in which Right, right. I don't think so, and I don't even know if students would have, you know, have generally had access to that kind of information. Well, Definitely. In and then it, there's a whole other set of issues with secondary versus right. elementary yeah. school. Yeah. Yeah, they do. It's just done in a different way. The model right. is structured differently, but they do. The problem is like, um, Gary, what do they use in the, as the pre, pre test? Um, most of the time, if it's, if it's sequential, they often use the prior test in that subject. Most of the time, it makes great uh, reading and math. Uh, oh, okay. So, math and yeah. To get three scores right. Prior. So you would have problems with the chemistry teachers and you know people who don't have like <coughs> a prior score in chemistry or something like that. Right. Yeah. You have yeah. To right. Right. That these other scores together yeah. Yeah. Are capturing part of the variability. Right. But <coughs> yeah. states have had in course exams do them all the time. In Florida, other states, you know, with tenth grade exams right. that are similar. To Mm -hmm. You lay out, except there's a two-year gap, but they're mm -hmm. attributing the effects to the fifth grade teacher. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Huh. Yeah, there's no like red hot chili peppers in high school, is there? So for people to look up and see, is it red hot chili peppers? What is the thing? No, there, there Not is, red hot chili peppers. What am I talking about? It's the same. <laughs> that's the band. <laughs> what am I thinking of? You just want a chili pepper. No, oh, chili peppers. Right, it's that. Um, <laughs> right, right, your professor. No, that, right, right. They right. that for high school, too. Oh, they do? Yeah, I've looked at this uh, girl. Yeah. Okay, so maybe <laughs> there's. <laughs> 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 yeah, so maybe there's some of this going on. Of course, we have to question how correlated those things are with true teacher quality, but anyway, yes. <laughs> uh, okay, so measurement error. This is a thorny subject. So is there more measurement error at different parts of the, did I skip a slide here? Let me just make sure I didn't. 
OK, no, I didn't. OK. So is there more measurement error at different parts of the achievement distribution? So first of all, so this is an important question to ask, because any kind of fix we have for measurement error, it generally assumes classical measurement error, where it's kind of like distributed randomly across the distribution of like test scores. Um, but here we have a situation where there's a very good reason to believe it's not distributed randomly. It's not classical measurement error. So we've got a situation where, first of all, our test items are concentrated at the middle of the achievement distribution. So that part of it's probably ferreted out pretty well. But you've got probably fewer items at the end, ends of the, the two distributions. Fewer really you know, easy items and fewer really hard items. Um, and then you're going to have more blank, blank items and guessing at the bottom ends of the distribution. So, you know, kids just leaving stuff blank. Um, so that messes up the, the score. And then the IRT, the item response theory model, um, the way it works, it just naturally produces measurement error that is greater at the highest and lowest ends of the achievement distribution. So there's just much more reliability at the middle of the distribution. So how does this play out for teachers with higher low performing students? So in this paper that's um, a draft, it's pretty much ready for submission, but we use administrative data and we find that teachers who teach certain types of students tend to have value added scores that are less stable over time. So we find that the teachers teaching the low achieving students and the minority students, they actually, if you look at their year to year correlations and value added, that they're lower than the ones teaching the higher achieving students. So wait, I put this on this slide. It may not be a measurement error story. It may be something else. But we do know <laughs> that there is this kind of strange phenomenon. And maybe what, pe what do people think might be the reasons for that? I mean, there are a number of reasons that you could come up with. But um, it would be interesting to get your take on this. We're still struggling to find the stories that, that explain these findings. Yes, yes, I would probably phrase it a little bit differently. But if I'm, the, uh, if I'm a person, if I'm a teacher who has like lo low achieving students in my class, um, and often if I have them low achieving teachers last year and this year, um, I'm probably going to have less stable value added estimates from year to year than my colleagues who have high achieving students. Yeah. So, I mean, this makes me think of, um, I mean, it's a type of measurement error, but not necessarily test measurement error, right? Like, you, it might you just have much worse mashing of teachers to students in these situations. You've got much more student churn, and we have, we know we have a lot more teachers, teacher churn, mm -hmm. and less experienced teachers, like all of those things mm -hmm. together seem like they could potentially, maybe that shouldn't systematically well, that's a good idea. I, it's a good thought. I, I, I don't know which way it would work. So let's just say I would think that if there is a true teacher effect and the students are randomly t sorted to teachers, right, then you'd probably be getting better correlations across years um, if, if there's a true sort of abiding teacher effect. Unless the truth is that teachers really vary a lot from year to year, but I don't know that that's really true. Um, Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't seem like it would be the test measurement error that would be your issue, because then you would see the same lack of correlation between low achieving and high achieving. Right. That would be the middle of the distribution that you do well. With. That would be the higher. Um, yeah. So, like the guessing one. Yes. You know, maybe there's a part of that. Right? Yes. That yes. And, and the blanks. Be, yeah. Yeah. There's going to be greater yeah. variation in their responses over with low achieving. Mm -hmm. But the other ones, especially the higher achieving ones, I don't think that I don't think the tail ends of the distribution would have an impact. That well. We've been asking that question. I mean, I've been asking, you know, like, why isn't this symmetrical? Yeah. You know, why don't we see that the correlations are higher for the middle and, you know, lower for the two? But I, but there might be something to do with the bottom being worse, it, and it still could be a measurement error story. But it could also be that teachers are just more changeable. The teachers that 
the lower achieving students have are more changeable. Well, we're controlling for teacher experience, so it's not that they're less experienced. Um, well, I was thinking that if, if we think that the lower end of the achievement distribution is also like more disruptive in the classroom and introduces more behavioral issues, if the more behavioral issues happen in the classroom, the less stable over time the teacher's instructional quality can be from year to year. I mean, because if there's no behavioral issue, you have to assume like that kind of teacher would, would be able to deliver the exact same instruction year over year. Right, right. Right, right. Right. And if that behavioral element could only add variability to that. Yeah. I mean, the students, students at the lower end of the distribution, they have more variability in the scores from year to year. Um, so I don't know if that's a piece of it, too. Um, yeah? I'm wondering about um, thinking about the students and teachers relationally as a sort of interactive pair. Mm -hmm. for whom playing the school game has no clear payoff. Mm -hmm. And so um, it, teacher effect, it seems to me, may be a far more difficult thing to operationalize with these folks, because e with the high group and the middle group, even right. so many mer measurement errors, you're going to have the school game yeah. play. But with minority students and low achieving students, and my in my experience, mm -hmm. the difference is the school game. And so teachers mm -hmm. and students have a role to play in the school game. And mm -hmm. I would dig deeply into that. Hmm. Now in the school game, because I haven't heard this term before, but it makes perfect sense to me, is that in that research, is it for these grades like three to six, or is it high school more? Oh, anybody. A even so, there's still a students still have a sense of payoff, and okay. Yeah, Do you yeah. See any variation across uh, a little bit. Um, I think if I can remember, we look at. Actually, did I say three to six? We look at four, five, and six. Um, I'm trying. I can't remember, but there is a little bit of difference. But, and it's not like this totally ironclad pattern. So it is a little bit. Um, well, let me take your question for a second. Yeah, no, I, mean, I, I just want to build, actually, mm -hmm. on Mimi's and Laura's comments, because I think that it's in addition to the, the, the school game, I think that there is an issue about churn and policy in schools. And yeah. I think that schools at the lower end of the spectrum are far more susceptible to the next wave of what we're going to do to kids to make their schools Right, 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 right. And that changes from year to year to year in these schools. Um, so it strikes me that we should expect that the practice of teaching mm -hmm. is going to be Yeah, well, I think these are really good possibilities. Um, so let me throw one thing out there, too. So I, so, so Brian Stacy kind of like uh, was doing this, and he used the data for the whole state and finds this. And then he, then I said, let's do it on the ten, uh, the six biggest districts. And not all six have that pattern. Um, the other ones that don't have the pattern are just not significant. We don't see significant differences between the t teacher stability. So, so that makes me think it's not some kind of like absolute artifact of scores. Because first I was thinking, well, maybe this is just an artifact of the normal distribution. You know, you get the tails, they're more variable. I mean, the, the variance is greater. But yeah, yeah I mean, these are, these are really good ideas. I wonder, like, for example, if teachers just get bounced around across schools more teachers of low achieving students like because we know that there is more churn and maybe they just are they you know it's like learning the ropes all over again maybe you do have more variability um, so yeah okay Cassie, are you looking at um, uh, novice teachers because they tend to be assigned to these kids more than any other teachers and they um, in the student assignment so the novice teachers you expect to have less stability over time. Right. Low end of the distribution, not both ends, mm -hmm. which seems. Um, are, are you looking at the same time that you look at student characteristics and teacher characteristics? Well, so the way we do it is we compute the value added measures using a couple of these different formulas that I've talked about. And then 
we to get the correlations and the stability measures, we, we take the teacher, we do teacher regressions where we take current scores and we regress them on prior scores and look at that coefficient, but we control for experience. Now, it might be more powerful to just pull out, you know, separate the groups. Look, take the less, you know, the less experienced teachers out of the picture or, and then look at it and see. But yeah, those are all, these are all great suggestions. Makes me think that we're not so close to submission as I thought we were. <laughs> but it's a very provocative finding, you know, and it's like, wow, what does that mean, you know, if these people are getting less stable value? Yeah. The fascinating conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, historically, with Tennessee data, for the diplomas project, the rigor of the test was quite low. So even though the value added model was being applied, mm -hmm. the higher achieving students had less potential to demonstrate a range of growth. Mm -hmm. So the experience with Tennessee school system, ceiling effect, so. your higher yeah. achieving system mm -hmm. actually struggled to get better value added scores. So when you look at the high achieving Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's, it's the lower-achieving yeah. systems that, that are showing gain growth. Right? right. So if you have a ceiling effect and it's compressing right. the higher-achieving students, then maybe they're just more stable because so the they're all bad the <laughs> or they're not really. <laughs> yeah. Right, 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 right. Yeah. I'll think about that, too. These are great suggestions. These are all really, yeah. I'm mean, just thinking about the mm -hmm. point about this school always trying to be mm -hmm. so, um, obviously one way to, to think about looking at it too is actually looking at teachers within schools right that like this idea of because if, if it's just low achieving schools that's mm -hmm. one thing whereas if it's teachers teaching low achieving kids mm -hmm. in schools then that's a very different thing right as, right as far as what uh what the actual mechanism is right um, so just just something that, that yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good ideas. Okay, so let me present you with an even more odd puzzle. <laughs> uh, okay, so, so going back to the measurement error theme, um, we've got another draft that we're working on where we run simulations to see what effect measurement error may have on value-added measures of teacher performance. So this is simulated data now. We're not talking about actual data. So the preliminary results show that there can be bias in the presence of IRT-induced measurement error. And ceiling and floor effects can exacerbate the problem. We also, you know, the existing, so you'll see a lot of these, like the VARC estimator and everything, they'll have a, a measurement error correction in them. But it's, again, based on these classical measurement error assumptions. And they don't help in the picture. So let me just show you. OK, so here's. So we're going to take 16 teachers, 16 classrooms, and we're sorting students into the classrooms um, based on uh, teacher one having the lowest achieving students and teacher 16 having the best achieving students. And these are all sort of kind of gradations, you know, in between. Okay? So it's just from low achieving to high achieving students sorted into these classrooms. In our simulation, all these teachers have the same identical effect. They are, there's no teacher better than another. They're all the same. Um, these are test scores that we generated that have no measurement error in them. Okay, so no measurement error in them. We use our OLS lag that we like. And we actually compute our value added measures over a number of simulations. And that's where we're getting this box plot here. Um, and we're getting more or less, we're around that zero, which is what we, what we want. So there's like no real visible bias here. Okay, so we're getting pretty much, we're getting told that these teachers on average are going to get a value added score that's around zero, which is the true, the true effect, zero. Okay, now in this situation though, with no measurement error, our OLS gain thing, which may be the EVOS, <laughs> um, uh, something like that, is actually producing bias. Okay, but there's still no, no measurement error in the scores. All right, so now here's when we actually use 
so-called observed scores that are run through an IRT model. So let me explain how we do this. It's quite interesting. So we create data for these fake kids, and we know we create their test scores. We draw them from a normal distribution. Okay, so those are their true, their true achievement scores. Then what we do is we create a set of items, and we say, based on that true achievement score, their true knowledge score, how are they going to re respond in a probabil probabilistic manner to these items? And these items have specific characteristics that are matched to the state tests. So then we compute, then we take the item responses, and then we compute the IRT score using the IRT model that the states use to create our observed score. Okay? So we have the observed score computed in the same way that it's computed in the states and based on a bunch of item responses. And those item responses are based on some true, true achievement. So, so we take these observed scores and we compute our teacher value added. And now even our favorite OLS flag model is showing some bias. And we're showing that the, stu the teacher with the best students is looking like the best teacher. The teacher with the worst students is looking like the worst teacher. And there's a lot of overlap, right, in the middles, but their tails are not great. And in fact, the current title of this paper is called Sending Value Added into Tailspin. Because, I mean, you know, the thing about simulations is it may not reflect reality too heavily, but you're, you're pushing on things to see how we can make things go wrong so, so we can learn something from it. So we see even in the presence of IRT measurement error, even this one is not looking so great. And look what the OLS gain does. It goes, the, the bias goes the other way, whereas the teacher with the, you know, with the lowest performing students is looking like the best teacher. And the teacher with the highest performing teacher, the students is looking like the, the worst teacher. So are you saying that the amount of IRT error you induced here is reflective of reality of the tests for the state that you are a given state? Yeah, it has to be. Yeah. So I'm, I'm well, oh words, yeah, so, so how far from reality yeah, is it? So yeah, that. well, that's a good question, but um, I'm trying to remember actually in these particular graphs, because we can make it worse or better just depending sure. on how we, so in the IRT model, it's like the three parameter logistic and we've got the difficulty parameter and a guessing parameter and a discrimination parameter, so depending on how we tweak those, it could be better or worse, but yeah, these are not that divorced from reality, so what, but what is potentially divorced from reality is how much sorting there is here. So if there's a lot of randomness in the situation, um, then, you know, this probably won't be too big a deal. But, yeah. Do you have any sense that if uh, the test moved to like, a computer adaptive test, like even some of the mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. So I'm not an assessment ex expert, but my guess would be it would help because, right, you're going to be fleshing out that, like, the high-end student can suddenly show, they can be differentiated better at the high-end, right, so you get rid of some of that error, and then the, the lower-end student also can be differentiated better because you're not, you, you know, you're giving them items that allow them to um, differentiate themselves more, maybe. There are a lot of problems with those too, though, you know, administering those. But yeah, that's, that's a good point. So, anyway, um, I, I yeah, yeah. My let's other question. I mean, assuming your, parameter, your parameters are roughly reflective of reality, I mean, mm -hmm. I'm looking at the scale, and I'm assuming these are standard deviations because they're going from negative 4 to 4. Are they standard deviation units on the. I mean, can I look at this and say, even though you have oh. similar teacher effects, that you're getting a two standard deviation difference? Yeah, 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 yeah. That seems big, assuming that you're what you've done to the parameters is, yes. re is reasonable in, in yes. terms of how much sorting there is, what the amount of IRT or the I know, support. right. Those are big, big differences. Right. It's troubling. I mean, it's troubling to me, and I don't know yet. I mean, this is very preliminary, but um, because, you know, up till now, this, this, this one model was, I felt fairly safe with it. And now it's kind of like, hmm, can it really? So here's the thing about value added is we, when we apply it, 
we want to use it. We don't really care about all these teachers in the middle. We really want to do, you know, good things to the ones at the top and bad things to the ones at the bottom, right? We want to like, we want to like reward the ones at the top with pay or, you know, awards or something. And then the ones at the bottom, well, maybe not bad things. You know, maybe we want to send them to professional development or whatever. Or, but in some cases, maybe they want to dismiss them or, um, you know, sanction them in some way. And so if we're not getting the tails right, I think up till now there's this belief that, oh, well, these may be very flawed measures, but the tails, you know, the tails of the value-added distributions are pretty trustworthy. We know if somebody's way out here, then that person's really good. If somebody's way over here, that person's really bad. So I, you know, this is what worries me is that if we're not sure what we're getting in the tails, then I think we need to really pause and figure this out. So, yeah. So have you thought about doing something in, when you run the regression that, that tries to correct for the measurement error? Well, so we, we do, well, that's a very good question. So, so we use the, the, the classical measurement error correction. It doesn't alter these pictures. No, because that, that, that sure. assumes everybody has the same degree of measurement error. Exactly. Right. But, right. but there are more advanced well, we have one. There's one that we pulled out of the literature. I forget. It's the heteroscedasticity robust measurement error correction or something like that. Yeah. Yes. And that doesn't work either. In fact, it's worse. Go figure. <laughs> so. Okay. Well, what about using a shrinkage estimate of the kids score rather than the, the actual kids score? So, so calculate the empirical Bayes estimate of what the kids score is. Mm-hmm. So we'll shrink the kids back towards the mean. Well, that's a good thought. I mean, I think what we, where we sort of came to on this paper is I wonder if we can figure out a way to undo it. Since we, we're simulating this all in there and know, we know all the equations and processes that are going into creating this, can we undo it? And maybe... No, but you don't really want to do that. You want to confront a researcher with this, with, who won't have that ability. Oh, yeah, that would be the ultimate step. First step is let's just figure out in the simulation, knowing what we know, what, what we would mean, need to. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, how do we make it unhappen? You know, what, what, how can we, so where can we pull off? And with, I mean, that would be what we want to do. Is, is, there a, is there a variance correction? Um, is there a, you know, um, a, a, a measurement error correction that can be created that will work. And this, the, the one that the heteroscedasticity one not working was a little sobering. In fact, we looked at it. So here was the thing. I think the, uh, I shouldn't speak without, with my, the poor quality of my memory. Um, it seems to me, I, I think we did the heteroscedasticity heteroscedastic measurement error correction. And it looked like, at first, we said, oh, the, oh, it had big, 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 big bars, you know, big, big uh, interquartile ranges uh, there. And so we were thinking, oh, that's not so bad. And they were all kind of lined up. And then I said, but look at the little black lines, like where the actual medians were. They were terrible. They were like, you know, it was like a line like this. And so it's, it was just, they threw in a lot more imprecision, but what they were estimating on average or, you know, the median was, you know, actually quite poor. So I don't know where to go, you know, yet. I mean, we're, we're working on this, but um, any suggestions, even as you think over these things, with, you know, just email me. I'm, it's very, it's very interesting problem. Yeah, all these little black lines. I, I, I can't remember. I think it's, I think it's this way, but I, I can't quite remember which way the bias went. Um. Mm -hmm.
Oh, well, that's a good question. So, so with, um, with the gain score model, what you have, let's see if I have time to go back to your, um, to the slide, but let's see if I can just get back there. Um, it's just the way that the um, error term is constructed and the sign of it, it's, it's going to control the, the direction of the bias. So, let's see, which one do I want to look at? So, if we think that this is like, let's say this is the true model, and then you, um, there's no pen there, but if you, if, 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 and then if you just subtract it off from both sides, AIT minus 1. So this side becomes AIT minus AIT minus 1, which is the gain score. And this side becomes lambda minus AIT minus 1. But then you don't put that on the right-hand side when you're estimating it. That lambda minus 1 times AIT minus 1 becomes a piece of the error term. Okay, and it's got a very specific sign based on what lambda is. If lambda is 1, it goes away, right? Lambda minus 1, 1 minus 1, 0. If lambda is not equal to 1, then you've got this thing lurking around in your error term, and it's got a specific sign on it. And so it creates bias in a different direction from other types of bias that you might see. Any other questions? Okay. Well, I just have, I don't have much more. Um, it's just that uh, I think recommendations best based on what we know so far with some caveats, uh, obviously, are, you know, use, let's use lag score specifications, probably use fixed teacher effects. Um, we need further research on these unknowns. Um, so what should we do with it? I mean, I was going to put this out to you. I think this is my last slide, unless you want to see my backup slides. But, um, you know, what, how would you like to use this information? <laughs> That's my question for you. So, so people are, 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 are doing study after study where they are showing, are kind of picking at the different parts of value mm -hmm. uh, and showing uh, reasons that it doesn't work on for this mm -hmm. reason with this set of right. this set of kids, this kind of sorting, mm -hmm. this kind of test measure here, and so forth. And yet, policymakers are doing it all over the country. They're That's going right. Faster and faster, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, you you said at the beginning, or uh, towards the beginning of the talk, that your view is that you think these measures should be used, but with mm -hmm. the caveat that. We have to be careful about what they are telling us. Mm -hmm. I think the big worry from lots of teachers is that, you know, they, these are not reflective of my performance at all. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I'm not sure that we should use them, but with the caveat that actually we don't really know what they're measuring is not a very helpful. It's not very helpful, right? So right. Uh, what I would like to hear you kind of say is mm -hmm. maybe you want to get it from the audience first, but mm -hmm. I mean, what is having looked at this across a bunch of different mm -hmm. studies and looked at a lot of different simulations and a lot of different data? I mean. How should we be thinking about it? I mean, mm -hmm. are, is there utility in these measures that policymakers can draw from, um, given all the things that you've just shown us about the things that we don't know and the things that we know that look pretty bad? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Gary wants to answer. Yeah. <laughs> I'll wait. Answer I'll wait. Is, uh, <laughs> yeah. when, when we looked at, and we've done pretty similar kinds of analyses, but um, when you try to identify the 5% worse and best teachers, we get that really wrong with a lot of these models. But when you try to identify 20% of the tails, that gets that gets better, a lot better, uh, in terms of false okay. positives and false negatives. Okay, but what's your stand that you're measuring it against? I have simulated data. And, oh. and, and basically, we've run it with, okay. with different kinds of, of problems with the data, but, mm -hmm. but the main one is the the sorting problem. So from that and other mm -hmm. things we've done, we've taken it that, that the best use of this should be screening. So that it gets down to the subset of teachers who most need professional 
development, observation, and specific professional development or, or coaching, uh, and that it makes your process a lot more efficient than simply assigning all the teachers to professional development. So you identify, you, if you can identify the folks who are most in need of that, then you've at least targeted that. But for high stakes, it's, if you were, you know, some policy paper briefs have been written suggesting just every year five, fire the five percent of the teachers that are lowest performing. Yeah, I think that's and, crazy. Uh, it is crazy, mm -hmm. but, uh, <laughs> but it doesn't keep people from putting it on paper and, mm -hmm. uh, Having excited a lot. Well, I think they're trying to do these thought experiments. Is if you know, if we could fire the word, yeah, I know, I know what you're saying. But, but the high stakes stuff, I mm -hmm. think, is dangerous. The middle stakes stuff, uh, uh, doing some kind of screening and then remediation with mm -hmm. those teachers might be. And that's that's our idea about the most appropriate. So, so why I, is it crazy? What's what's so crazy about it? I mean, are, Firing the lowest 5%? Yeah, are you really thinking that you're going to hire somebody who's no better than the, the bottom 5%? Well, no, but the concern is that you're getting it way wrong. Yeah. Right. yeah, like what if they're the best teachers? Well, what is the probability that they're the best? <laughs> what is the chance that if you fire somebody that you've measured in the bottom 5% that you're going to hire somebody worse than that? At, at grade 5, when we were expecting, we identified 250 teachers in, that were at the bottom end, at the bottom 5%, we misidentified in the simulated data that was sorted data uh, in some of these methods, 232 teachers. So we fired 200, we only fired This is simulated 80. data though, so we don't have well, measurement well, error. Well, but the, but it's, it's got a lot of complexity built into the, mm -hmm. the data. Oh, wait, a minute. wait a minute, this is one year, this is a one year measure of teacher effectiveness? But, but that's... You're not using three years. Just using one, and, this, and and you didn't. Your your measure of being off is that they weren't really in the bottom five percent, right? Right. But we, you were trying to get the bottom five percent, and they weren't really there. But were they in the bottom ten or the bottom fifteen? I mean, what is the odds that if you hire somebody new, they're going to be worse than the person you identified as in the bottom five? That, that's, that's a very relevant question. But for the URM model that's currently being used in many states for the EVOS. That's what I was trying to remember uh, before, the URM. Uh, they, the univariate. Now, this is not the MRM, which yeah. is a better performer. But for the URM, uh, they only run it on one year of data uh, at a time. And those estimates, I, I'm simply doing the estimates the way, the closest to the way the policy world does those estimates. But you're simulating data assuming true scores, number one, right? That's the way our simulation was from the paper one, right? Where we came up with the lag score model being better than, probably better than the URM. So, but put some measurement error in those scores. I, I know, we haven't, we haven't simulated Yeah, so that's what this last paper right. exactly. is about. So, in this, and this is saying that you might actually get it the wrong way completely, you know, where the best teachers are looking like the worst teachers. So, yes, and then I'll answer Jason's question. Well, it seems like, you know, some of the regulations coming out of the mess that you're trying to manipulate this with information coming from both the students and the teachers. Um, so, you know, right. Well, I definitely think we should have multiple measures of teacher performance taken into consideration. So, so when I became a tenured faculty ma member, I, I was placed on the annual review committee, the Mer merit review committee, for two years in a row, and I saw how faculty members were evaluated. And I thought, this is not that fair. You know, <laughs> but we have multiple measures, right? And so, you know, and we live with it, right? We think it gives us some kind of a signal of something. So it's not that fair. So my feeling is how we're faculty members. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I mean, my feeling is, first of all, we live in a world where almost everybody gets evaluated in their job in some way, right? So let's not just like toss out all information and say, oh, well, we can't get at the very truth and, you know, therefore we shouldn't even try. So I feel like there's a value to assembling the information and looking at it. Now, if I were a teacher, 
I would want to see my, the value added portion of it, you know, and there's going to be the, the observational me measures, and I'll get to that in a second. I would want to see my, the value added portion. I want to see, tell me what I am in the gain score model. Tell me what I am in the, you know, the EVOS model. Tell me what I am. I want to know what I am in all these different models, where I rank. So that, that would be my first thing. Why we, why policymakers are choosing just one and running with that, I don't know. Because I would want to know how many teachers are going to get very different evaluations with different models. But, but don't you think that's exactly why the policymakers are taking Yes, they don't want that ambiguity yeah, to deal exactly. with. They I mean, don't want to deal with it. Then if you're a teacher and you have your varied scores that put you at the bottom and the top, you can yeah. completely freak out with good reason. Yeah. Second problem with all of this, you know, I'm not going to give an easy answer because there isn't one, but, you know, the observation-based measures, as we know from the MET report, which is groundbreaking, wonderful work, that there, there's a lot of unreliability in the measures. You know, you need a lot of training, you need a lot of observations, and then you can get your reliability scores up a little bit, but there's, you know, I mean, they're not that great either. So, um, and they don't correlate that closely, necessarily, with the value-added measures. So what's the reason for that? Well, it could just be that they ne don't necessarily have to. They could be picking up the transmission of, you know, like classroom management. They're, they're better at getting at, you know, how well a teacher keeps the class engaged, keeps students questioning, that, all that stuff that you can observe. But a rater may have a harder time understanding if somebody's really teaching these kids how to add and divide or whatever properly. So they may be better at picking up certain things and then the tests may be better at picking up other things. So there's not necessarily a reason to believe they have to be highly correlated, but the idea of triangulating is a little tricky because you're just bringing different types of information into the picture. And then they also, in the MET report, they have the student evaluations for these middle school kids. So. Um, I don't know what to say after so, <laughs> but, <there's laughs> but I mean, I think you want to bring a lot more information to the table. I also think we should have better tests. I think maybe we should test kids longer, but, you know, that's not going to please a lot of people. Um, what was it? Walker, right? Yeah. yeah. So weren't you saying, too, that sometimes, so, so here's another problem. Principles may be evaluated on... Um, how well their judgments, their observations of teachers correlated with the teacher value added. So sometimes they may go in and actually have an opportunity to tweak their judgment because they can go and look at the value added and they, that's not good. <laughs> I mean, you know, so it's like one is influencing the other. And so, you know, I think you really have to think through these policies and how you're designing them and also bring more in information to the table and just kind of like hold your horses a little bit on the, the sanctions, you know. Maybe you, you can go ahead and distribute rewards, might not be that bad, but, you know, particularly this issue of firing people I think is, is problematic right now because I don't think we understand these things yet and how well we can safeguard against some of the potential perversities that might be in there. Is that a good time to? Well, we have ten more minutes, I guess. That's right. So, and I don't know if that's just because they're not using either shrinkage estimators or if really there is like huge, I can't believe there's huge uh, like ability differences over time that a teacher has unless mm -hmm. they're very new teacher. So how stable are these, do you think, and, and do you think they're trustworthy to use one year or should we be using three to five year averages? Well, obviously if you're using averages, they're going to be more stable, right? Sure. So if you're using a three year kind of a three-year moving average for a teacher. And then the next year, two of those years overlap. It's going to have a higher correlation from year to year. So you're building in stability or instability depending on whether. I mean, the, the most potentially unstable ones are going to be the ones where you just use one year of data on a, you know, just take, take one teacher's classroom, you know, this one year's classroom, one cohort of students that this teacher sees. And, um, and that 
you know, will have more instability in it. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that's, that would be that bad. Um, particularly, like, let's say if you had a scenario where the teachers taught many, many classes. So, like, a sixth grade teacher or a seventh grade teacher may teach three math classes. So they actually have a fairly sizable number of students contributing to the score, so we don't have to worry about that small sample size issue. But it's in just in one year. Well, that would be ideal because, you know, you wouldn't have to, I mean, you, you could look at the, you get something a little bit more precise. But I mean, there's just a lot of things to consider. That's why when somebody says, you know, we did these value added, and I, I can't think of, I mean, most research papers, we really have to dig to see exactly how they did it. You know, how many cohorts they used, you know, what their model exactly was, and there's just a lot of decisions to make. So yes, they do, they can bounce around. And then in this, this paper that we have with the different stabilities according to which groups of students you're serving, I mean, that's, um, that's another issue. Yeah. I think another interesting issue when we start looking at older kids is this picture that kids are on teams, right? So teachers work on a team. You're an amazing English teacher. I'm a horrible social studies teacher, and everybody else on the team is also horrible, horrible, horrible. Right, right. Now, we also contribute to, hopefully, or take away from their literacy mm -hmm. needs. So you can only do so much, right? They only, but mm -hmm. you are completely judged on their literacy, even though we are damaging. Yes, so, yes. True? Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Well, and then that leads to sor all sorts of labor market outcomes that you might not want. Whereas a teacher, a good teacher in a school full of poorer teachers, just may, I'm going to get out of here because my score is looking bad, um, you know, uh, and therefore they'll ditch that school and make that school even worse. So there's, yeah, there's a lot of problems there. Um, yeah. Have you or others done work on peer effects? either among the teachers or in mm -hmm. the, within the students value added? We're working on a paper now. It's pretty preliminary. And peer effects are tricky. So um, they could actually pervert, produce some perverse outcomes, putting in classroom variables. Um, so it's a little tricky. There's certainly a lot of culinary issues to consider. So yeah. In the piece where you're seeing the different variability in the uh, test scores for uh, for the low performing or high minority mm -hmm, student mm -hmm. concentration. Yeah. Are, what are you doing to account for name variation in the number of valid test scores that are being used to formulate the value added? Like if, if you've got higher student mobility among those groups, right, and, it, and you're not you're not counting just test scores for kids at the beginning of the year or if they have smaller class size for those things. Could it be just the issue that you raised at the beginning of small sample size increasing your... Um, hmm. Well, well we, do it, we, do, we do an empirical base and we do a OLS lag. Yeah, I don't think that the small sample, but one thing he said made me wonder about um, the issue of mobility. So if there's more error in the assignment of students to teachers, if maybe they're leaving in the middle of the year and we're actually getting teachers who are teaching not well assigned, I'm wondering if that could play a role. I don't know. Like That's a good point. You or yeah. Or you're only getting the partial effect of the teacher yeah. for half the year or something. That's a good thought. We should do some, uh, well, I don't know if we, I don't think we have measures of mid-year, you know, I don't think we have like a start of the school date. The policy is in place, right? It's just, it's on, you know, in some areas, they, you wouldn't count the, you wouldn't count the kid mm -hmm. towards, as being in the teacher's class unless they've been there for a certain portion. Right, right, right. So this just maybe uh, you can also think of it as like an absentee issue yeah. too. Um, I think we put absences in there. I'm trying to remember. 
think we did have absences. That's a good question, though. I have a lot to go back and work on now. <laughs> but if you, you know, honestly, I, if this has been provocative to you and you have other thoughts, I really, really value hearing them. So please feel free to email me. I didn't put my email up there, but it's just my last name at indiana.edu. So you can get it from Jason or Mimi or anybody. So. so it's 4.30. I think Cassie's willing to hang out for a couple minutes if people want to come up and ask questions. But uh, otherwise, you can uh, help me say thank you.